Welcome to Good Shepherd Sunday, the fourth Sunday of Easter. We have beautiful agricultural images in our readings today. Even the responsorial psalm, beautiful images of the shepherd and the meadows. Jesus says twice, I am the gate. I am the gate. He's the shepherd. He is the gatekeeper. He is the gate. He's the way that leads up to the gate. He's the Lamb of God. I am the gate. I want to focus on that as we ponder who the shepherd is for us today. This is especially pertinent to me because I just got back from a five-day trip to Texas. My best friend and I, Father David, is from Northern California, spent time on a ranch in a place called Henrietta, Texas. We also spent time on a ranch owned by somebody that I worked with in north, north part of Fort Worth 40 years ago who owns a ranch in Nakona. That's where they make Nakona boots in the last place in the United States of America where they make American baseball mitts. And we spent time on ranches in the area of Wichita Falls. And those places, all of them, have gates. And we had to open and close a lot of gates. And those of you who have traveled around mountainous parts and rural parts in both the desert and the high country of Arizona know about gates. If you've been on the dirt roads, you know that gates oftentimes have to be opened and closed. And I'll give you a little secret. You're not a good passenger in a vehicle if you make the driver get out and open and close the gate. Now, understand if you have problems with your legs or you know walking or you're disabled or what have you, but if you're not, you need to open those gates. That makes you a good neighbor, open and close those gates. And if the gate is open, and there's a sign that says, leave it open, leave it open. And if it says, please close the gate, we close the gate. If we find the gate closed, and there's no sign, we close the gate. And we're bad neighbors, and I've seen this out in the field. I haven't seen the people personally, but people that leave gates open, that shouldn't be left open. What is, what is the function of a gate but to keep that which is not needed or shouldn't be in the area where the gate is closed? It keeps things out and it keeps things in. And Jesus says, I am the gate. We hear in the first reading those early people that come to Peter and the 11. Peter and the 11 are upstairs in the upper room. And it's the day of Pentecost and the Spirit comes upon them. They're up there and they're kind of scared. And the Spirit comes upon them and rests upon them and then they rush out the door and they start preaching in all different kinds of languages to the people that are outside. And the people that are outside are in town for a Jewish festival, and these are people from all over what we call the diaspora, the Jews that were scattered all over, that maybe speak all kinds of different languages that have come to Jerusalem. And Peter is out there boldly proclaiming, God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ, and we are witnesses of these things. And our job is to witness to you This Jesus, whom you crucified, he desires to give you the life, the life of God. He whom you crucified he wants to bring you the Spirit. And they they say to him, they say, they were cut to the heart. I said, well, we crucified Jesus. They're like, ooh, that's not good for them. 
We can say the same thing today. It's just as pertinent today. Our sins put Jesus on the cross. So Peter could be saying the same thing to us and maybe we're cut to the heart. And I hope in some sense we are cut to the heart that says, I need the Lord Jesus in my life. And they said, brothers, what are we to do? And Peter responds, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, which we have just received moments ago that came down upon us in that upper room. And now we're on the streets proclaiming Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead. You will receive that Spirit Jesus says he is the gate. Many folks, they look around in the church and they're like, eh, I don't have the spiritual life maybe that my spouse does or that these guys that are involved in this ministry or that ministry. Maybe I'm just genetically different and the Lord hasn't called me to any kind of thing like that. It's about opening the gate. Sometimes we have stuff in here that, we, that doesn't belong in here and stuff that we need to let in or someone we need to let in. We have to open the gate. Nobody can do it for us. Nobody can do it for us. That gate is in our heart. And only we ourselves can open that gate. Nobody can do it for us. Just yesterday, we brought the leaders of the parish, different ministries together, to talk about a program that the staff, a good chunk of, well, the staff and a, and a, and a, a parish leadership team on staff have been involved in for a number of years. And we want to take it to the next level. And we talked about the amazing parish. This is what the program is called. And there were people there, rightfully so, saying, we have an amazing parish. It's like, yes, how can we make it better? It is an amazing parish. But I would think that every mass would be full if that is, I mean, we're just out, you know, just beyond wonderful, beyond amazing. And it's true, it is an amazing parish. And, and I can't take credit for that. Spiritual fatherhood that preceded me put all those building blocks in place. And then you folks, I mean, I didn't, I didn't come here and say, well, you're not singing at liturgy, so I'm gonna keep putting. No, you were already singing before I got here. Even Bishop Olmsted noticed that. I was installed as pastor on Good Shepherd Sunday four years ago, and Bishop was here, and he said, man, one thing I just love about St. Timothy's is that people sing. Those ministers that we were talking to, those leaders, you know, they were talking about the retreats we give and the youth, all the things that we do for the youth and all the things that we do in the parish, and they're wonderful things. But we can't, we can't make a conversion. We can't open that gate for someone. I talked about we can create the condition for the possibility, but only the individual, only you, only I, can open that gate. Let me give you an example of that. Father Charlie, and many of us know him and remember him. He's a pastor over here at Our Lady of Mount Carmel now. He shared about his conversion, his opening of the gate. I don't know all the details, but he was a child of the 60s. He admits that he was a hippie, and he smoked those funny cigarettes. And he had all these philosophies and things like that, played the guitar and all these kinds of things. I don't know exactly what happened to him, 
But somewhere along the line, he opened the gate. And he let the Lord come in. And he allowed the Lord to stay there. And reside there. And change his life. Many people are afraid. What a... What, 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 what do I do? I mean, I'm afraid to let the Lord in. He, he could change my life. Yeah. And if you keep him outside the door and you live your life according to your agenda, I got to ask you, who is God in your life? Is it this one or is it this one? I'm afraid. I don't know what he's going to do. I don't know what he's going to do either. There's a Protestant pastor out there that rightfully says, you know, if you let him in, he's going to take you places you've never been. And it's true. I mean, I was away from the church for 15 years, doing life on my own terms, and I knew something was missing. And eventually I found my way back to the church. And eventually it took a while to open that gate and say, come on in, come in, come in. And this is what happened to me. Other people have different stories. But I ask of you today, if you're in sacramental communion, to receive the Eucharist, who is Jesus Christ, and tell him after you say amen, tell him in your heart, or maybe you whisper it on the way back to your pew or at your pew, Lord, I'm doing my best to hold the gate open, come in, come in. What happens if I'm not Catholic and I'm not eligible to receive communion or I'm a Catholic that's you know, like I was, was away from the church for a long time and not yet in sacramental communion? Maybe some dominoes have to fall before I get there. Can I do this too? Absolutely. You could do it up in the Adoration Chapel. Lord, I'm holding the gate open as best as I can. Come in. Or we could open the Bible and read, I don't know, maybe some of the gospel. Lord, I heard what that priest said about opening the gate. I am really trying to hold it open for you. Come in. Friends, this is how we have a personal encounter with Jesus. And that's what the parish wants. That's what the priests want. That's what our bishops want. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ wants. A personal encounter with him. And as Catholics, a liturgical encounter with him, which involves all of us. Just like a, it's like a, a foretaste of heaven. All of us together, worshiping the same Lord, saying, we are opening the gate. So today, come to the Lord. Open the gate. Say to him, come in. Come in, come in.